Good morning and welcome to worship. As we gather, let's take a moment. Pause. Still ourselves and breathe in. Feel the Spirit of God moving in us, through us, gathering us together, even as we're a part into this time of worship. Breathe and listen. Do you hear the voice that is calling us here and into this time? The one that calls us children of God? This is the voice that beckons us. And as God's voice welcomes us this morning, let us welcome God as we pray. God of love and mercy, we come this morning to hear again the words that you speak, the promise that you will be our God and we will be your people. This, we know, should be the wellspring of our joy, the beginning of our salvation. Even as we whisper the words, they are more than we could ever comprehend. In your love for us, you have forgotten more than we can ever think of. You have forgiven more than we can ever hope to. You have shattered the hardness that can encase human hearts and planted within them the seeds of grace and hope. As our journey of Lent continues, our prayer this morning is that you will continue to give growth to these seeds. For as the hour of faithfulness arrives, we know, God, that if we would see Jesus, we must turn our vision to the ways of your kingdom and open our hearts to his leading. If we truly want you to create new hearts within us, we must acknowledge the old ways in which we continue to live and seek your mercy as we confess all that keeps us from living as your children. And so together and in silence, we bring our confessions to you now. Gracious God, write your grace upon our hearts. Write your mercy upon our hearts. Write your hospitality upon our hearts that we might know your forgiveness, your mercy, your love, and become more like Jesus Christ in offering these things to others. For we pray in his name, the words that he teaches us, saying together now, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, this is the good news, that the mercy of the Lord God is from everlasting to everlasting. And God loves us. Through Christ, we are cleansed. Through Christ, we are healed. Through Christ, we become new people. A new heart, a generous spirit, a fresh start. These are the gifts God gives to us in Jesus. Thanks be to God.
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my inequities. Create me in a clean heart, O God. And put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. And sustain me in a willing spirit. Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us for service. Um, today we are going to be saying a prayer um, together uh, is marking our one year of the pandemic um, this Sunday. And so we know that it has been challenging for a lot of people, um, children included. I know that it's been really hard for you guys going back and forth from school to homeschooling and parents working from home and being with family all the time. But um, yeah, know that we do think of you and care for you and um, God loves you. And it won't be like this forever, but um, we're going to remember doing this prayer now. Um, yeah. This yes. Here. Well, thank you, Sydney. And it's good to be with you to do this. Like Sydney says, it has been a it's been a whole year since we were last together in the sanctuary, all of us. And we remember that. We look forward to the day we can do it again. But in the meantime, we have this special prayer. So let's pray together. Um, so, but I'll start, Sydney, and then and um, and if everyone could just close their eyes and we'll we'll pray together. God, you are with us all the time. All the time, you are with us. Today we remember. We remember how things used to be. We remember how many things we've gone through. We remember things we missed and people we lost. Today we hope. We hope for healing. We hope for vaccines. We hope for wisdom. Today we share. We share smiles with one another. We share our joys and our sorrows. We share our dreams for the future. God, you are with us all the time. All the time you are with us. Be with us as we remember, hope, and share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. No let's worries. worship. Yeah, let's worship together. Hey everyone, good morning. Thanks for joining us for Children's Time. We're so glad that you're here this morning for service. Well, this morning I have a few things I wanna to talk to you guys about. Um, to start, congratulations. We have made it one year through quarantine, through a pandemic. That is big, so go us. This is good that we have made it through and hasn't been easy. And I know that we've lost people along the way and there has been lots of sad moments, but there has also been lots of really happy and joyful moments. Um, and so, yeah, I want you guys to think about this week um, as we come around the one year mark of the pandemic happening. Where did you guys see good in the world this past year? Where did you see people being kind to one another and helping one another, being strong and courageous and brave. So you can think about that. 
And so in our story today, we are talking about Joshua. And um, this is a verse that you may know that we've talked about in Sunday school or you've heard this song. But be strong and courageous. Um, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Right? So like I was saying, those people that have been strong and courageous and brave um, during this time. And we know that God has been with us this whole time, wherever we were, however we um, were dealing with things and what happened, God was with us. And so in our story today, the story of Joshua, we are coming to a point where the Israelites have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. That's a long time. It's a lot longer than a year. So imagine if we had to deal with something like this for 40 years, it would be a long time. A lot of our ancestors, um, or not ancestors, sorry, a lot of our grandparents would probably have passed away. It would be a very different world, right? 40 years from now. And so Joshua and the Israelites have been in the desert for 40 years and they are being given the promised land and Joshua is going to be the one to lead them to it. And so um, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. I will be with you wherever you go. And I think this is a really important message to think about as we walk into this um, coming year, as we wait for things to open up again, as the pandemic is still, we're getting vaccines and things are still pretty uncertain and we're not sure what's going to happen. We know that God will be with us and he um, will give us the strength and the courage to keep going. And so we know that the Israelites um, trusted God and Joshua trusted God and he led them into the promised land. And some things you can think about this week. So here from our story, I just told you, how do you think Joshua believed that he could lead people. And hmm, another one to think about would be how do you trust someone? What kind of things do they do in order to earn your trust? Do you trust God? Do you trust that he knows what's best and that he will be with you? I know I do, even though it's really hard sometimes. So as you guys think about this this week, remember the verse that we said, be strong and courageous. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And as you continue to deal with um, things with school and your friends and the vaccine and all the things that are gonna be in the year to come, know that God is with you. So let's just bow our heads as we talk to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a vaccine for this pandemic, for this coronavirus. We thank you, God, for the strength and bravery and courage that you give us. We thank you for all the uh, essential workers and people that are taking care of those who can't take care of themselves right now. We pray, God, that you would give us strength and courage and that we would remember you are with us wherever we go. And we pray that you would bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you, Karen, of having me to contribute to this Sunday worship. I feel blessed. I would like to share my deep regret in the face of the sad and very hard reality of the death of a Cameroonian woman in Montreal yesterday named Mihai Jomo, who was mother of three children. The fight against anti-black racism requires and will require more patience, more perseverance, more courage, more resilience, more leadership, more prayers, 
more forgiveness and more love. Diversity, inclusion, belonging will remain just words. And I will add politically correct words if the work does not start at the individual level to relearn and rediscover one's own identity and history. Then realizing that alongside one's own history, there is the history of others and then learning the history of others and accepting it too. Once we come to know the diversity of so many histories and so many identities, we can move beyond to realize that only one truth remains, which is human identity. That which is common to the whole of humanity. So, it is not about the death of a black woman or the death of an indigenous woman from neglect in a hospital. It is simply about the death of a person, a human being. This is what we must remember. And this is where our humanity calls us. Thank you. I am Dr. Laurentine Mushinga Nefi, and I send my sincere condolences to the family of Mireille Jomo, who is experiencing this indescribable moment of deep pain. As we open the scriptures this morning, would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we come to your word this morning, looking for life, seeking your love. We pray that your spirit would move among us and inspire our reading, and that as we read and hear, your word will continue to plant the seeds of your grace and your mercy in our hearts, that we might bear witness to you and your life in our living. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are two scripture readings this morning as we continue our journey through Lent and our discussion of covenant. The first comes from the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We continue by turning to John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Jesus and his disciples are on, in Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and we read, Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Peter went and told Jesus. And Jesus told them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who lose their life, those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory. It's strange to hear glory used in the way it is by Jesus in this passage to refer to his being raised up on the cross, dying the death of a criminal as his moment of glory, the hour that has now arrived. Glory. C.S. Lewis describes glory in the biblical sense as, um, well, as very very different, I suppose, to the way we understand it in our world. In our world, he says, we understand glory as fame and attention. And that's, that's the same in the Bible, except that the fame and the attention are, are not of the exalted, wonderful type, but more of the type that, that many people would not want brought on themselves at all. That kind of glory. And yet, and yet this is God's glory. There's a weight to it as Jesus is raised on the cross, as the world turns on him in this moment of judgment against the Savior. God's glory is revealed in God entering into this suffering and the judgment, not of the world, but of God, that calls all things, even those arraigned against him, the beloved enters into even death. This kind of glory isn't the fame and attention we normally seek. It's the weight of God's attention, God's glory, God with us, God focused on us, God embracing us even from the cross. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, Jesus had said, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. In his dying, Jesus will rise again. But it is still hard to look at the cross and think of glory. Last January, I attended a day-long event hosted by Citizens for Public Justice. It's a national faith-based agency that works to promote research, policy analysis, and public debate around concerns of poverty, climate change, and refugee rights. The morning, I, well, my morning for that, it was a day-long event, my morning began in a workshop about Indigenous justice in Ottawa that was facilitated by two women, Jennifer Valiquette and Denise Ann Boissonneau. And Denise, and Denise Ann and Jennifer are Indigenous women who both work with the Odawa Native Friendship Centre and are also involved in the work of the Indigenous People's Court which operates in Ottawa and handles plea and bail hearings, adjournments and sentencings that take into account the unique and individual circumstances of Indigenous defendants who find themselves before the law. The stories of their work that Denise, Ann and Jennifer told were compelling. Lent was only a few weeks away at the time and in the reflection that was provided that morning there had been words about Jesus dying a criminal's death on the cross. And so when Jennifer Valiquette began to speak in her presentation at the workshop I was at, she noticed, or she noted for us, how that had stood out for her. To reflect on Jesus dying a criminal's death on the cross was quite meaningful for her because she pointed out that those who are so often referred to as criminals in the justice system are people who are known to her and her community as mothers and sisters and brothers and neighbors. They are people we know and who have a story, she said. And Jesus' death on the cross 
as a criminal resonated with her because of that. Denise Ann went on to speak about her own work. She encouraged us to consider in all things how sometimes the greatest journey we take in our lives is from our head to our heart. The journey from things we know, um, ideas we have, the things that um, inform the way we look at the world um, and how they're changed when, when individual stories move our knowledge of these things into our hearts. Perhaps in our, our own day, it's that experience we, we have sometimes when we are faced with the numbers of the pandemic and the news, they're big, they're hard to get our heads around the devastation. It, we feel almost removed from it until someone we know is ill and suffering. And then the reality is, is awoken in our heart again. And, and as the story of one we care for enters into our heart, our hearts are broken open to the world. The journey from the head to the heart. That's a lot of the journey to the cross, I think. It's what Jeremiah, I think, was introducing the people to in some way when he spoke about the new covenant that God was going to put in God's people's hearts, one that would not be written on stone tablets that, that they could choose not to look at and obey, but one that would be written in their hearts that would in, inform who they were and that they would live out of. When Jeremiah spoke to the people and, and spoke these words, it was during the time of exile. This was a shift in the way Jeremiah had been speaking. Up until the people went into exile, he was a prophet who was called time and again to speak to his people about the ways they were not keeping the covenant that we talked about last week the covenant at Sinai, the ways they weren't loving God and they weren't loving their neighbor. Those were, the, those were the great sins of the Israelite people that Jeremiah was calling them to account for, idolatry, social injustice, all these things. Um, but then, then exile happened. The Forces of Babylon arrived on the scene. The city walls were destroyed, the temple torn down, or the temple destroyed, the city walls torn down, the king of, of Judah taken into exile in chains along with the, the leading intellectuals and leaders of, of the people all into exile. Everything looked like it had come apart. The people of God had lost much. And in some ways they were beginning to wonder if they had lost God as well. In their lack of faithfulness to the relationship with God and each other, had they lost God? And into this pain and into this suffering, Jeremiah has a new word, and it's a word of hope because it's a word of God's promise that no, God is even outside of the land that, that was so much a part of the, the previous covenants, God is still with them. God is still their God, they are still God's people. And the days are coming, there's a promise. The days are coming, says Jeremiah, when I will put a new covenant in their heart. Covenants we've been talking about quite a lot lately. They're, in the Bible, they're not, well, they're, they're sort of like, but they're not at all like at the same time, the contracts that are negotiated between two parties that enter into the relationship willingly with with a detailed um, analysis of who owes each other what, and if that fails, then the covenant falls apart. The covenants in the Bible are, well, they're more unilateral than that, right? They are often initiated, well, they're initiated by God, who's got a lot more power than the people have. Um, their consent is really not required. It's more their response that God is looking for. There's no room for negotiation. They're going to be God's people. God is their God. And this is because in, in the biblical story of covenant, 
This is God's way of working through relationships with God's people, entering into relationship with God's people, even if they will turn from God, to bring about God's purposes for the world, God's purposes for renewal, for restoration, for forgiveness, for, for making right that which is broken in the world and restoring the world to shalom or, or that peace of God that surpasses understanding. Jeremiah says, my law will be written on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I was reminded in a book I was reading recently um, called His Story. It's, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury's book for Lent, that about, well, I think it was last year for Valentine's Day, the high street jewelry shop Pandora for Valentine's Day had a campaign that said, show her that you know her. Surely, the author of his story writes, it should say, show her that you love her. Show her that you know her. And as the writer reflected on this, he thought perhaps to be known actually is to be loved. It's often the case, I suppose, that presents that are chosen with true knowledge of the person are better gifts than those that are overly extravagant and end up somewhat useless to be known god says i will know them they will know me in a world where we are increasingly anonymous where even before COVID isolation was a problem to be known is to be seen as a human being it recollects to me um Jennifer Ann, Jennifer's words at the Citizens for Public Justice workshop, you know, um, people who in, in many eyes are seen as criminals, but known to her and those who love them as mother or sister, father or cousin, to be seen for who they are and not a projection of someone else's understanding of them. When we are seen by God, we are known this is the good news for the people in exile in Babylon, isn't it? That, that God sees them. They're not just defeated captives in their, in their shame of their exile, in their fears, in their abandonment. God sees them. And even as the rest of the world might be judging them, even as they might be judging themselves, God draws close and loves them. God knows them. The days are coming, says God, when you won't have to teach. It'll be, it'll be known in your heart. The journey from the, the head to the heart is a powerful thing. You think about um, those you know with your own heart. The, the way the, you know many things about them. Um, you, you see things in them, or people who, who know you and, and see gifts in you you didn't know you had, who encourage you or who you encourage. Um, knowing in the heart brings out the best in people because it comes out of relationship and the way of living when you're known in the heart is entirely different than when you're trying to live out of something you just know in your head. Um, does it make it easier if I, if I invite you to think about it like this? You have two people who are locked in a, in a struggle um, for, I don't know, recognition. They each have their own side of the argument that they would have the other known, right? And, and as they, if they're operating out of the things they know in their head and, and the facts, um, the law of love given at Sinai, the loving God and loving each other, sometimes too easily forgotten and overlooked when, when we're up in our head. But when the law is in our hearts, through the working out of God's Holy Spirit, and we know and see each other not just as a projection of our own desires or, or some, or, or a, out of a desire to have them see our way, but, but because we're open to to who they are and the reality of their own experience. And our struggle then isn't about 
trying to steal from the other their point of view, but to listen and, and grow together, then then, then you could say that we, well, it doesn't make the struggle to, to reconcile easier perhaps, but because we're operating from our hearts and with a seeing and recognition and a knowing of the other as a, a person, well, it makes it all the difference. Does that help? The journey from the head to the heart, it is an invitation to Remember that in exile, God saw the people. God knew the people and spoke of the day that was surely coming when they would know God like this, not as a projection of what they want a God to be or of their own desires, but of one who's come to dwell in their hearts. And in so doing, they're able to dwell in relationship with each other as well. The journey from the head to the heart, to, it leads to the forgiveness that is at the heart of God, the reconciliation. The days are surely coming, says Jeremiah. It's not unlike Jesus speaking of his lifting up on the cross. Let me tell you another story. This one comes from Jean Vanier. He tells the story of a very successful businessman who knew a lot about success and very focused on prosperity, um, achieving good things for his family. He had a wife and three children, and it was working well for him until one of his children developed a psychotic illness and his world was turned upside down. Until it comes into our own living, we don't often know what to do with mental illness. And this man had not had to live with this in his heart before. He, he knew something of it, but now it invaded his life. He who had always known what to do had no idea what to do, but he loved his son. And drawing close, he came into a community of other families and friends who were supporting people with similar challenges. And in them, he came to know that the pain he had known, he came to know, he came to enter into their suffering, to, to know a pain he hadn't known before, but at the same time, as he put it, to become more the human he was called to be. The head to the heart, dying to rise, bearing fruit for God's kingdom, Christ raised in glory. This is the story of God at work in the world through relationships with us and the relationships we're called to have with each other. The story that comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ who came that we might have life and life abundant, life eternal. This is a promise, a covenant, the relationship that can be trusted, that we can put our hope in, because everything we know as a people, that we have been told from generation to generation, is that the one who made those promises is faithful. And even in the darkness, new life will burst forth. And this is the truth, that, that the day is surely coming. As Christ says, it's Indeed, it has arrived. In the moment of faithfulness, and the invitation to journey from our head to our heart, and to follow Jesus as he picks up his cross. Amen.
Before we get to our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession this week, I do have some announcements to share with you. Um, in the coming week, we do have our breakfast gathering on Zoom on Saturday, March 20th. We are actually going to be talking about or sharing moments when we've made the journey from our head to our hearts ourselves. I'm looking forward to that. And if you want the Zoom link to join us, just contact the office. And on Sunday next week, March 21st, if you've been part of the Reading the Bible in a Year project or you're just jumping on board and want to be part of it, the readings come out in the Friday email each week. You can find them on the website, but on the third Sunday of each month, we have a Zoom gathering to talk about what we're reading. This month, it's largely Deuteronomy, just beginning to read um, Joshua as well and moving into Judges from there. So we'll be talking about that next Sunday morning and if you want the Zoom link again contact me or the office. The week after next is going to be Palm Sunday, March 28th. Sydney has obtained enormous number of palm branches that she will bring to you if you would like them with the invitation for you to stand outside your house and wave them and film a video clip of you saying Hosanna to the son of David or blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord and to send it in so that we can put together a palm procession from home for Palm Sunday this year. So do reach out to Sydney if you want to be part of that and we'll make sure that you get your palm branches so that you can participate. It'll be a great way to um, be together on that morning even as we're apart. Holy Week comes after that. There will be um, an intergenerational event on Maundy Thursday at 7 o'clock, um, Good Friday. There will be a service of scripture, reflection, and music with Tom and myself. And then on Easter Sunday there will be our celebration of the resurrection. That will be April 4th this year. Um, details, are, as always, are in the Friday bulletin, and if you have questions, just reach out. Those are our announcements. In our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, we give thanks to God for our blessings, and we lift up to God through Christ our needs and our prayers for the world and those we love. Let's pray. God of life, God of this world from the beginning of time you have been our hope the ground on which we stand the rock of our salvation the giver of promise the bestower of life and we offer you this morning our praise and thanksgiving for the love that comes to us in christ that never ceases to reach out to us calling us by name and so mercifully redeeming us as the truth of your forgiveness your welcome the belonging we have in you takes root in our lives. May we in turn learn to offer it to others and bless us as we come to work towards peace and healing your purposes in a world that is too often broken and divided. Open us up, Lord, to the needs of those around us. Give us wisdom to see each other, to value each other, to know each other as a child of God indeed. Guide our thoughts as we pray now for this world and, and those who dwell in it. Holy God, you are the one who gathers up all that is lost and scattered, that seeks to bring all into the umbrella of your mercy and love. And we pray this morning for those who are struggling, those who struggle with loss in their lives this week, loss of position, relationship, loss of family or love, loss of self and loss of life. Our prayer for them in days when future seems uncertain is a prayer for hope, that they will not despair, but will come to find themselves settling on the ground that is your love, and that even as they feel darkness all around, they will take root in that love and grow into new life. We pray, O oh God, for those among us who we know are facing hard times these days, we pray for those whose difficulties might be known only to you and to themselves. As we take a moment to speak their names in your presence, we trust them to your care as your children, each one more precious than gold. And we pray that they and those who care for them will feel so treasured this week. Holy God, we pray this morning for all those who are beginning new lives, new marriages, those with new babies, new jobs, new homes. We pray for those with new dreams, 
new hopes, and those who are simply beginning anew this morning because they have found forgiveness and life in you. We pray that they will be nurtured and cared for in this new life, that its tender roots and shoots will be buffered from the storms and that they will grow in your love and come to share it with those around. We give you thanks for the gift of each other, for the community here at St. Andrews that you have placed us in, and as we together claim your promises of life and forgiveness for all people, we pray for ourselves that we will grow in love, that as we live and grow and breathe in you, you will help us to keep firm in the promises of new life you put before us. Help us to build our lives and the life of this community on the bedrock of your love, that your covenant will be our hope, and that we will sing of your glory and tell the story to each other and all the world. We pray these things in the name of the one who, in whom all things are made new, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Lent and responsive reading was in the email that went out on Friday, but it's also, I think, on the screen beside me now. And so I invite you to read with me as we continue our Lenten journey. I'll read the parts that are um, preceded by an L and invite you to pick up in the parts that have a P and we will read together. The journey to Jerusalem is long. This is a wilderness journey and we're not always comfortable, but we trust and we persevere. God's people are familiar with the wilderness. After Egypt, they wandered in hunger and thirst, confused and tired, waiting for the promised land. Our destination is different. We aim for Jerusalem, where it all ends, and where there will be new beginnings. Let us pray. God of the wilderness, give us strength when we wander. When we stray and grieve, hunger and thirst, you have promised to make water spring up in the desert. Quench our thirst. Feed us with manna. Strengthen us when we are tired or lack trust. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Wherever we go this week, wherever we are, the good news is that God is with us. There is no place we can go that God will not be there before us, behind us, beside us, and within us. Go this week in the power of the Holy Spirit to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. Go this week in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.